who was Rasputin. Grigory Rasputin, 1872-1916, was a Russian mystic and quasi-holy man who rose from peasant farmer. To become advisor to Tsar Nicholas II, 1868-1918, and his wife, Tsarina Alexandra, 1872-1918. Sometime in 1905 or shortly thereafter, Alexandra had come into contact with Rasputin. And, showing he was able to effectively treat Nicholas's and Alexandra's severely hemophiliac son Alexis. 1904-1918, Rasputin quickly gained favor with the Russian rulers. But the Prime Minister and members of the Legislative Assembly, the Duma, could see Rasputin was a disreputable character, and they feared his influence on the Tsar. They even tried to exile Rasputin, but to no avail. By 1913, one year before the outbreak of World War I, 1914-18, the Russian people had become acutely Aware of Tsar Nicholas's weaknesses as a ruler not only was his government subject to the influence of a pretender like Rasputin. But the events of Bloody Sunday had irreversibly marred the Tsar's reputation. That year the Romanov dynasty was marking its 300th anniversary. Members of the royal family had ruled Russia since 1613. But public celebrations, intended to be jubilant affairs were instead ominous as the crowds greeted Nicholas's public appearances with silence Russia's entry into World War I proved to be the beginning of the end for Nicholas with Rasputin at the front and center of the controversy that swirled around the royal court during the first year of fighting against Germany, Russia suffered one military catastrophe after another. These losses did further damage to the Tsar and his ministers. In the fall of 1915, urged on by his wife, Nicholas left St. Petersburg and headed to the front to lead the Russian troops in battle himself. With Alexandra left in charge of government affairs, Rasputin's influence became more dangerous than ever. But in December 1916, a group of aristocrats put an end to it once and for all when. During a palace party, they laced Rasputin's wine with cyanide. Though the poison failed to kill Rasputin. The nobleman shot him and deposited his body in a river later that night. Nevertheless, the damage to Nicholas and Alexandra had already been done. By that time virtually all educated Russians opposed the Tsar, who had removed many capable officials from government office. Only to replace them with the weak and incompetent executives favored by Rasputin. The stage had been set for revolution. Backslash who was Carrie Nation? The Kentucky born Carrie Nation, 1846 to 1911 became famous as a temperance agitator in the early 1900s. The saloon was illegal in her resident state of Kansas. And she felt it was her divine duty to take her hatchet to ruining any place that sold intoxicants. Between 1899 and 1909, she went on wrecking expeditions, which she called hatchetations. 
throughout the state, incurring the wrath of business owners and government officials. Though many might have favored national prohibition of alcohol, nation's actions were extreme to say the least, causing her to be arrested, imprisoned 30 times, and even shot at. She persisted, however, buoyed by the belief that she was performing a public and even divine service. The propitiously named Carrie A. Nation, who tried, it seems, to carry the nation straight to the water fountain, did not live to see prohibition made into a national policy in 1917 nor to see it revoked in 1933. Why is Napoleon still controversial? Even history has not been able to sort out the widely disparate opinions of the diminutive French ruler. And both the detractors and the champions, or some would say. The apologists, continue to publish their arguments and supporting research. The most obvious point on which scholars differ centers on the fact that First and foremost Napoleon Bonaparte, 1769-1821, was a military man. Here opinion divides quite naturally. Not long after Napoleon assumed power, in the coup of 1799, he proceeded to keep France and the rest of Europe at war for more than 10 years. From the French perspective, Napoleon was a great man. A brilliant strategist who could not only muster his troops but could keep them motivated to fight one campaign after another. The targets of these campaigns England, Russia, Austria, Germany, Spain. And Portugal among them view Napoleon in quite a different light, as would be expected. Researchers from these countries have seen and rendered Napoleon's dark side. Calling him a megalomaniac and a psychopath, and even seeing him as a forerunner of Adolf Hitler, 1889-1945. To further complicate the matter of how history views Napoleon, before he declared himself emperor for life. In 1804, and launched his military conquests throughout the continent and beyond, 1805. Napoleon enjoyed a brief period in which many Europeans not just the French believed him to be a hero. After all, he assumed leadership of France after the hideous period of Robespierre's terror and the ineffectual government of the Directory. And then he proceeded to make peace with the Americans, the Russians, and the British. Many believed Napoleon was just the man to bring order to the chaos France had known since the storming of the Bastille. And he extended an olive branch to France's longtime enemies. It looked like he would restore order at home and abroad. Of course this honeymoon did not last. By 1805 the leader many had looked to end the turmoil only became the cause of more turmoil. His compulsive war-making, as one writer put it, soon swept over the continent. Ultimately uniting various countries in an effort to rid Europe of the scourge that was Napoleon and his grand army. Thus, students and readers are left to sort through the diverging accounts of this controversial figure. Napoleon has been called the Emperor of Kings, credited for his vision, insight, courage. And even with the development of the modern liberal democracy, 
he has also been described as a compulsive tyrant who had an insatiable appetite for battle, a man whose own ambitions left millions dead. But on a few descriptions both sides can agree, he was a brave soldier. An inspired military leader, and, at least for a time, a charismatic ruler. What is capitalism? The cornerstones of capitalism are private ownership of property, capital goods. Property and capital create income for those who own the property or capital. Individuals and firms openly compete with one another, with each seeking its own economic gain. So that competition determines prices, production, and distribution of goods. And participants in the system are profit-driven, in other words, earning a profit is the main goal. Capitalism is the antithesis of socialism. A theory by which government owns most, if not all, of a nation's capital. There is no pure capitalist system. National governments become involved in the regulation of business to some degree. But the economy of the United States is highly capitalistic in nature. As are the economies of many other industrialized nations, including Great Britain. Who invented jazz? Ferdinand Jelly Roll Morton, 1885-1941, a New Orleans pianist, claimed credit for having invented jazz. And to some degree, it was fair of him to think so after all, his recordings with the group The Red Hot Peppers. 1926-30, are among the earliest examples of disciplined jazz ensemble work. But in truth, the evolution of jazz from ragtime and blues was something that many musicians in several cities, took part in. Most regard Morton as one of the founders of jazz, the other founders include Benny Moton. 1894-1935, U.B. Blake, 1883-1983, Duke Ellington, 1899-1974, and Thomas Fats Waller, 1904-1943. Some would go back even farther to trace the roots of jazz, from 1899-1914 Scott Joplin, 1868-1917, popularized ragtime, which was based on African folk music. Even astute music critics may not be able to draw a clear-cut distinction between ragtime and early jazz. Both musical forms rely on syncopation, the stressing of the weak beats. And either style can be applied to an existing melody and transform it. The definitions and boundaries of the two terms have always been subject to debate. Which is further complicated by the fact that some musicians of the time considered ragtime to be more or less a synonym for early jazz. But there are important, albeit not strict, differences between the two genres as well. Rags were composed and written down in the European style of notation, while early jazz was learned by ear. Players would simply show one another how a song went by playing it. 
jazz encourages and expects improvisation, whereas ragtime, for the most part, did not. And the basic rhythms are also markedly different, with jazz having a swing or hot rhythm that ragtime does not. Whatever its origins, jazz became part of the musical mainstream by the 1930s and influenced other musical genres as well including classical. American composer George Gershwin, 1898-1937 was both a songwriter and composer of rags as well as a composer of symphonic works. Many of his works, including Rhapsody in Blue, 1924, and his piano preludes, contain ragtime and jazz elements. Perhaps more than any other composer and musician, Miles Davis. 1926 to 1991, expanded the genre, through decades of prolific work. Davis constantly pushed the boundaries of what defines jazz and in so doing set standards for other musicians. What was the 9-11th's commission? It was the 10-member group created by a congressional act signed by the president. On November 27, 2002, the Bipartisan Commission, consisting of five Republicans and five Democrats, was chosen by Congress to look into how the attacks of September 11, 2001, could have happened and how such a tragedy could be avoided in the future. During its investigation, the commissioners and their staff reviewed more than 2.5 million pages of documents, interviewed more than 1,200 people in 10 countries, held 19 days of hearings, and took public testimony from 160 witnesses. The commission wrapped up its work in all due speed. Publishing a full report less than two years after it received its mandate. The 567-page report chronicles the events of 9-11, looks at the roots and growth of the new terrorism. Reviews the U.S. response to the attacks and to previous assaults including the August 1998 U.S. Embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania, and recommends changes to prevent further terrorist strikes. The report was made available as a book and an online document. Presented to the American people for their consideration. Among the key disclosures in the report were that the Commission found no credible Evidence that Iraq and Al-Qaeda cooperated on the attacks against the United States. That finding was immediately dismissed by the White House in June 2004. The Commission also reported that the original plan for the Al-Qaeda attacks on the U.S. homeland included a total of 10 hijacked airplanes, striking targets on the east and west coasts. The plan was dismissed by Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden as too complex. In the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks and the U.S. led retaliatory strikes on Afghanistan, the commission believed that Al-Qaeda had become more decentralized. With cell leaders assuming greater authority for decision making. Who started the Underground Railroad?
American abolitionist, lecturer, and nurse Harriet Tubman, c. 1820 to 1913, set up the network to emancipate slaves. Tubman was motivated to do so after she had made her way to freedom in 1849, and then wished the same for her family. I had crossed the line of which I had so long been dreaming. I was free, but there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. For the next ten years Tubman acted as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Making at least 15 trips into southern slave states. And guiding not only her parents and siblings, but more than 300 slaves to freedom in the north. She was called the Moses of her people for her emancipation efforts. The journeys to freedom were demanding and often dangerous missions. Though Tubman was small in stature, she possessed extraordinary leadership qualities. Author, clergyman, and army officer Thomas Wentworth Higginson. 1823-1911, called her the greatest heroine of the age. What were penny newspapers? Although the number of newspapers published in the United States climbed quickly during the first decades of the New Republic, the decades following independence. 1783, they were not generally accessible to the common man. Priced at an average six cents a copy, the cost was outside the reach of the average American. The labor-saving machinery developed during the Industrial Revolution. Late 1700s and early 1800s, was instrumental in lowering the cost of the newspaper. Because production costs were lower, publishers could charge less per copy. The first so-called penny newspaper, or one-cent paper, was published by Benjamin H. Day, 1810-1889 The debut issue of the daily The New York Sun Appeared in 1833. The American newspaper industry was off and running. Now reaching a mass audience, publishers worked feverishly to outdo each in order to keep their readers. By the late 1800s news reporting had become increasingly sensationalistic. Population growth, spurred by increased immigration at the end of the 19th century and early in the 20th century, meant there were plenty of readers for the now thousands of newspapers. During the first decade of the 1900s, before the proliferation of radio, invented 1895. The number of American newspapers peaked at about 2,600 dailies and 14,000 weeklies. What does 5440 or fight mean? The slogan refers to a dispute between the United States and Great Britain over Oregon country. Which in 1818 treaty allowed both nations to occupy. This was the territory that began at 42 degrees north latitude, the southern boundary of present-day Oregon. And extended north to 54 degrees 40 minutes north latitude, in present-day British Columbia. 
During the 1830s and early 1840s American expansionists insisted that U.S. rights to the Oregon country extended north to latitude 54 degrees 40 minutes, which was then the recognized southern boundary of Russian America, roughly present-day Alaska. The 11th President of the United States, James K. Polk, 1795-1849, used the slogan in his political campaign of 1844, after he was elected. Polk settled the dispute with Great Britain, in 1846, and the boundary was set at 49 degrees north. The northern boundary of what is today Washington state and the border between the United States and Canada. This agreement reached without the fight threatened in the slogan gave the United States. The territory lying between 42 and 49 degrees north latitude and Great Britain the territory. Between 49 degrees and 54 degrees 40 minutes north latitude as well as Vancouver Island. The United States portion is present day Washington. Oregon, and Idaho as well as parts of Montana and Wyoming. What was the first animal sent into orbit? The Soviets immediately followed the success of Sputnik 1, launched October 4, 1957, by sending the first animal into space, a dog named Leica. The female Russian Samoyed traveled in a pressurized cabin aboard Sputnik 2, which was launched November 3, 1957. Making her the first living creature to go into orbit. The trip ended badly for Leica, however, she died a few days into the journey. Before sending humans into orbit. Both the Soviets and the Americans needed to prove that animals could survive in outer space. While the Soviets experimented with dogs traveling in space. By the end of 1958 the United States would send a monkey into space, but not into orbit. The following spring, May 28, 1959, two female monkeys, Abel and Baker, were launched into orbit in a U.S. spacecraft and were recovered alive. They had traveled 300 miles aboard Jupiter. When did diamond mining begin in Africa? An 1867 discovery of a pretty pebble along the banks of the Orange River in South Africa led to the finding of a rich diamond field near present-day Kimberley. The city was founded as a result of the mining, in 1871. Similar to the California Gold Rush roughly a decade and a half earlier. The finding in central South Africa prompted people from Britain and other countries to flock to the area. However, the ultimate outcome was conflict, since both the British and the Boers who were Dutch descendants living in South Africa, claimed the Kimberley area, the First Boer War ensued in 1880. Who was Eugene Debs?
Debs, 1855-1926, was a radical labor leader who in 1893 founded the American Railway Union. ARU, an industrial union for all railroad workers. Debs was a charismatic speaker. But he was also a controversial figure in American life around the turn of the century. In 1894 workers at the Pullman Palace Car Company, which manufactured rail cars in Pullman, Illinois, near Chicago, went on strike to protest a significant reduction in their wages. Pullman was a model company town where the rail car manufacturer, founded by American inventor George W. Pullman, 1831 to 1897, in 1867, owned all the land and buildings, and ran the school, bank, and utilities. In 1893, in order to maintain profits following declining revenues, the Pullman Company cut workers' wages by 25 to 40 percent, but did not adjust rent and prices in the town. Forcing many employees and their families into deprivation. In May 1894 a labor committee approached Pullman Company management to resolve the situation. The company, which had always refused to negotiate with employees. Responded by firing the labor committee members. The firings incited a strike of all 3,300 Pullman workers. In support of the labor effort, Eugene Debs assumed leadership of the strike. Some Pullman employees had joined the ARU in 1894, and directed all ARU members not to haul any Pullman cars. A general rail strike followed, which paralyzed transportation across the country. In response to what was now being called Debs' Rebellion, a July 2, 1894, federal court order demanded all workers to return to the job, but the ARU refused to comply. U.S. President Grover Cleveland 1837-1908 ordered federal troops to break the strike. Citing it interfered with mail delivery. The intervention turned violent. Despite public protest, Debs, who was tried for contempt of court and conspiracy, was imprisoned in 1895 for having violated the court order. Debs later proclaimed himself a socialist and became leader of the American left. Running unsuccessfully for president as the Socialist Party candidate five times. In 1900, 1904, 1908, 1912, and 1920, he actively supported the causes of the international workers of the world. IWW, a radical labor organization founded in 1905. What is rag money? Rag money is a derisive term for paper currency. The name comes from the early days of paper money, when paper itself was predominantly made with the cotton and linen fibers from rags. Hence, bills were rag money. Given that valued currency was issued in silver or gold coins by the established governments of Europe, it is not surprising that Americans greeted paper currency which is nothing more than a promise of future payment in coin as something to be regarded with skepticism. After the Declaration of Independence, 
1776, the first bills that were issued by the U.S. government quickly became worthless. In its effort to fund the American Revolution, 1775 to 83. The Second Continental Congress printed so many bills, called Continentals, that there was not enough silver to back them up. The financial crisis that emerged did nothing to inspire American confidence in paper currency. Rag money continued to have its detractors even after the revolution had been financed by European loans and the U.S. government established the dollar as its unit of currency, 1785. When did sailors begin using latitude and longitude to navigate? It was after English inventor John Harrison. 1693 to 1776, presented his ship's chronometer to London's Board of Longitude in 1736. The instrument was Accurate to within one-tenth of a second per day, 1.3 miles of longitude. Since it was set to the time of zero degrees longitude, Greenwich time. It enabled navigators to fix longitudinal position by determining local time. Even though Harrison's award-winning invention was heavy. Weighing 65 pounds, complicated, and delicate, it was subsequently improved upon so that it could be used on any seafaring vessel in any weather conditions. Who were Leopold and Loeb? Nathan Babe Leopold, 1904-1971, and Richard Dickey Loeb, 1905-1936, were privileged. Well-educated, even brilliant young men who committed what they believed to be the perfect murder. Both were from well-to-do Chicago families. In May 1924 Loeb, then 18 years old, became the youngest graduate of the University of Michigan. He was to go on to postgraduate studies at the University of Chicago. Nineteen-year-old Leopold was a member of Phi Beta Kappa and a law student there. The two became friends, and, as testimony would later reveal, in the fall of 1923 became convinced that they could literally get away with murder that they could plan it, carry it out, and never get caught. On May 21, 1924, the pair carried out their dastardly plan. Their victim was 14-year-old Bobby Franks, son of a millionaire and cousin to Loeb. Franks's body was found, as were a pair of eyeglasses belonging to Leopold. The spectacles were traced to him, and he, and Loeb, who was part of Leopold's alibi, were grilled by the police. They stuck to their story for exactly one day. Then Loeb, believing Leopold had betrayed him, confessed. They were charged with murder and kidnapping. Under the counsel of noted defense attorney Clarence Darrow, 1857-1938, who had been hired by their families, the pair pled guilty, reducing what would have otherwise been death sentences to life in prison plus 99 years. In 1936 Loeb was killed by a fellow prison inmate. 
In 1958 Leopold was freed his sentence had been reduced by Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson. In exchange for the inmates contribution to testing for malaria during World War II, 1939 to 45. He lived out his life in Puerto Rico, where he married. Earned a master's degree, performed charitable works, and taught. What were the Crusades? The Crusades were a series of nine Christian military expeditions that took place during the end of the 11th century and throughout the 12th and 13th centuries. The stated goal of the Crusades was to recover from the Muslims the Holy Land of Palestine, where Jesus Christ, C6B.CA.D30, lived. When was paper money first used? Paper money first appeared in China during the Middle Ages, 500-1350. In the 9th century AD, paper notes were used by Chinese merchants as certificates of exchange and later, for paying taxes to the government. It was not until the 11th century, also in China, that the notes were backed by deposits of silver and gold, called hard money. Was Beethoven really deaf for much of his life? Yes, Ludwig van Beethoven, 1770-1827, suffered a gradual hearing loss during his twenties. And eventually lost his hearing altogether, in his early thirties. The loss was devastating to the German composer. In a letter to his brother he wrote, But how humbled I feel when someone near me hears the distant sound of a flute and I hear nothing, when someone hears a shepherd singing, and I hear nothing. At one point he even contemplated suicide but instead continued his work. He had studied briefly with Mozart, in 1787, and Joseph Haydn, in 1792, and appeared for the first time in his own concert in 1800 while the loss of his hearing later prevented him from playing the piano properly, it did nothing to hold back his creativity. Between 1800 and 1824, Beethoven wrote nine symphonies, and many believe that he developed the form to perfection. His other works include five piano concertos and 32 piano sonatas, as well as string quartets. Sonatas for piano and violin, opera, and vocal music, including oratorios. It was about the time that he completed his work on his third symphony. The Eroica, 1804, that he went completely deaf. Though he was himself a classicist, music critics often refer to a turning point marked by the Eroica. Which shows the complexity of the Romantic Age of music. A true genius, Beethoven's innovations include expanding the length of both the symphony and the piano concerto. 
increasing the number of movements in the string quartet, from 4 to 7. And adding instruments including the trombone, contrabassoon, and the piccolo to the orchestra, giving it a broader range. Through his adventurous piano compositions. Beethoven also heightened the status of the instrument, which was a relatively new invention, 1710. Among his most well known and most often performed works are his third, Eroica, fifth, sixth, pastoral, and ninth, choral, symphonies, as well as the fourth and fifth piano concertos. It is remarkable even unfathomable that these works, so familiar to so many, were never heard by their composer. A poignant anecdote tells of Beethoven sitting on stage to give tempo cues to the conductor during the first public performance of his Ninth Symphony. When the performance had ended, Beethoven his back to the audience was Unaware of the standing ovation his work had received until a member of the choir turned Beethoven's chair around so he could see the tremendous response. When did the first jet airplane take flight? The aviation event took place in 1939 in Germany, just as World War II was beginning. The development of the jet aircraft was made possible by British inventor Frank Whittle. 1907 to 1996, who built the first successful jet engine in 1937, the Germans copied Whittle's design. The engine propels an object forward by discharging a jet of heated air or exhaust gases rearward. Whittle's Company Power Jets Limited, built the engine for Britain's first jet plane in 1941, which became the model for early US jets. During World War II, Great Britain, the United States and Germany all employ jets, though in limited numbers, in their military operations. After the war ended, 1945, aircraft manufacturers began developing jet airliners. The innovator in the field was the de Havilland Aircraft Company. Founded 1920, which produced the Comet, the first commercial jet. The aircraft was used by British Overseas Airways Corporation. Now British Airways, which in 1952 initiated passenger flights. But flaws in the comet's structure were later discovered to be the cause of several mid-air explosions. The craft was redesigned, and in 1958 British Airways launched transatlantic passenger service using the improved Comets. U.S. Jet Airplane Passenger Service was introduced by American Airlines in 1959. The airline used the Boeing Company 707 to transport passengers from New York City to Los Angeles. Why did the Russians burn Moscow? The September 14, 1812, torching of their own city was directed by Tsar Alexander I. 1777-1812 to 1825, who wished to prevent Napoleon Bonaparte, 1769-1821. to 1821. And his invading armies from reaping the benefits of anything Russian. 
Through a series of wars, Napoleon had dominated most of Europe by 1805. The authority of Alexander was certainly threatened by the French Emperor. In 1805 and 1807 Russia suffered major losses in battles with Napoleon's armies. In the face of these defeats, what Alexander did next was a stroke of genius. Though he had many detractors at the time, Napoleon's forces, though victorious, were weary from fighting and were unable to pursue the Russian armies further. So, Alexander made peace with the Emperor in the Treaty of Tilsit, 1807. The Russian ruler vowed support of Napoleon, and for his part. Napoleon believed Alexander had extended him a hand of friendship. Instead, the cunning Russian ruler had bought himself and his country. The time they needed to gird themselves against powerful Napoleon. By 1812 Russia, its economy dependent on exports, resumed trade with Great Britain, Napoleon's archenemy. This prompted the return of Napoleon's troops to Russia, later that year the French emperor marched into Russia with a force of as many as 600,000 men, but the Russians still delivered Napoleon a crushing defeat. The Russian army had relied on guerrilla warfare tactics, including burning their own countryside. Napoleon returned to Paris in defeat by the end of the year. Who was Dante's Beatrice? In Dante's masterpiece The Divine Comedy, the central figure is led to redemption by a character named Beatrice. His earlier guide through hell and purgatory was the great Roman poet Virgil. Dante Alighieri, 1265-1321, was born in Florence, Italy, where he also spent much of his life. In 1274, at the age of nine, he was introduced to Beatrice Portinari, they met again nine years later. And Dante was profoundly affected by her beauty and grace. When she died in 1290, Dante was inspired to commemorate her in several works. Most notably the Divine Comedy, c. 1308-1321. Beatrice is also depicted in Dante's The New Life, c. 1293, a collection of 31 love poems. He wrote The Banquet, c. 1304-1307, another collection of lyrical poems, to commemorate Beatrice's death. What is the basis of the conflict over the Gaza Strip and the West Bank? The conflict is rooted in Jewish and Arab claims to the same lands in the Palestine region, which was under British control between 1917 and 1947. The Gaza Strip is a tiny piece of territory along the eastern Mediterranean Sea and adjacent to Egypt. After the nation of Israel was established and boundaries were determined by the United Nations. UN, in 1947, the Gaza Strip bounded on two sides by the new Israel came under Egyptian control. The Arab-Israeli War of 1967 resulted in Israeli takeover and occupation of Gaza. 
but unrest continued, and in 1987 and 1988 the region was the site of Arab uprisings known as the Intifada. A historic accord between the Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO, and Israel, signed in May 1994, provided for Palestinian self-rule in the Gaza Strip. This has been in effect since though peace in the region remains elusive. As extremists on both sides of the conflict stage sporadic acts of violence. The West Bank, which does not neighbor the Gaza Strip, is an area on the east of Israel, along the Jordan River and Dead Sea. The West Bank includes the towns of Jericho, Bethlehem, and Hebron. The holy city of Jerusalem is situated on the shared border between Israel and the West Bank. By the UN mandate that established the independent Jewish state of Israel in 1948, the West Bank area was supposed to become Palestinian. But Arabs who were unhappy with the UN agreement in the first place attacked Israel. And Israel responded by occupying the West Bank. A 1950 truce brought the West Bank under the control of neighboring Jordan. This situation lasted until 1967, when Israeli forces again occupied the region. Israelis soon began establishing settlements there, which provoked the resentment of Arabs. The Intifada uprisings that began in the Gaza Strip in 1987 soon spread to the West Bank. In 1988 Jordan relinquished its claim to the area. But fighting between the PLO and Israeli troops continued. Peace talks began in 1991, and the agreements that provided for Palestinian self-rule in the Gaza Strip also provided for the gradual return of West Bank lands to Palestinians. The city of Jericho was the first of these lands. In August 2005 Israel began pulling out of the Gaza Strip after 38 years of occupation. Some Israeli settlers resisted Prime Minister Ariel Sharon's call for withdrawal. But Sharon insisted the move was a critical step toward peace and securing Israel's future. When was the Office of Homeland Security formed? The Office of Homeland Security was organized in the days following the September 11, 2001, terrorist attacks. President George W. Bush, 1946, chose Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge, 1945, as the first Office of Homeland Security advisor. Ridge was sworn in on October 8, 2001. The office was elevated to the department level on November 25, 2002, when President Bush signed into law the Homeland Security Act, creating the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, and making Ridge a cabinet-level administrator. The DHS consolidated several existing agencies and pledged to carry out new initiatives to the extent possible, protect the nation from further attacks. Agencies and sub-departments within the DHS's purview eventually included the Transportation Security Administration, Customs and Border Protection, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. 
the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection Offices. U.S. Citizenship and Information Services, formerly the Immigration and Naturalization Service. ORINS, an Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, the U.S. Coast Guard. And the U.S. Secret Service. On February 15, 2005, Ridge was succeeded by Michael Chertoff, 1953. A former U.S. Circuit Court judge. Chertoff had also worked as an assistant attorney general, in that position. He helped trace the 9-11 terrorist attacks to the Al-Qaeda network and worked to increase information. Sharing within the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, and with state and local officials. How big is the Harry Potter sensation? British author J. K. Rowling's, 1965, Harry Potter series, following the adventures of a young wizard. Debuted in 1997 and has been so popular with readers that it set new records in the publishing industry. It also made Rowling one of the wealthiest people in the world. On December 21, 2004, it was announced that the sixth of seven planned books in the series would be released on July 16, 2005. That volume, titled Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, immediately shot to the top of bestseller lists in the United States and Great Britain, based only on advance orders. The announcement also gave a boost to the stock prices of Rowling's UK and US publishers as well as major book retailers. At that time about 260 million copies of the first five books had been sold worldwide. And it was anticipated that the sixth would be the largest selling trade book of 2005. Selling at least 11 million copies in the United States alone. In sizing up the runaway publishing success that is Harry Potter, Steve Riggio. Chief Executive Officer of Barnes & Noble Book Retailer, said. Sales from the fifth book grossed as much as a major Hollywood movie in its first week of release. Indeed that book, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, was released on June 21, 2003. And became the fastest selling title in history on the first weekend of its publication. And all Harry Potter books have been number one bestsellers. These numbers translated to great personal wealth for the British author who, by her own account, had been on the dole when she began planning the series in the mid 1990s. In spring 2004, Rowling made her debut on Forbes magazine's annual list of the world's richest people. Her $1-billion fortune ranked her 552nd on the list of 587 billionaires. What was the Ottoman Empire? It was a vast Turkish state founded in the 13th century by the Osmani Turks. Turks who were led by descendants of Osmani, 1258 c. 1326, by the middle of the next century, 
the Ottoman Empire consisted roughly of modern-day Turkey. The terms Turkey and Ottoman Empire are used interchangeably. The empire was expanded further by conquests during the 1400s. Including the conquest of the Byzantine Empire in 1453. At its height, the Byzantine Empire extended over an area that included the Balkan Peninsula. Present-day Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, and Herzegovina. Macedonia, Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, Greece, and Turkey, Syria, Egypt. Iraq, the northern coast of Africa, Palestine, and parts of Arabia, Russia, and Hungary. The capital was placed at Constantinople, present-day Istanbul, Turkey. Thus the Turks established a Muslim empire that would remain a formidable force and influence in the region and in Europe for the next three centuries. During the 1500s and 1600s the Ottoman Empire was the most powerful in the world. It reached its most glorious heights during the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent, 1494-1566. Who ruled from 1520-1566, it was he who added parts of Hungary to the Ottoman territory. He also tried to take Vienna, but failed. He did succeed in strengthening the Ottoman navy, which dominated the Mediterranean Sea. Suleiman was not only an expansionist, but a patron of the arts and a builder. He ordered the construction of mosques to spread the Islamic religion throughout the empire, bridges, and other public works. But by the time World War I began in 1914, the Ottoman Empire had been in decline for some 300 years and only consisted of Asia Minor. Parts of southwestern Asia, and part of the Balkan Peninsula. As one of the losing central powers. The Ottoman Empire was dissolved in 1922 by the peace treaties that ended the war. When did the American cattle industry begin? As a large-scale commercial endeavor. The beef industry had its beginnings in the decades following the American Civil War, 1861-65. A breed of cattle descended from cows and bulls left by early Spanish settlers in the American Southwest, spurred the growth of the industry. Named for their long horns, which span about four feet, by the 1860s they had multiplied and great numbers of them roamed freely across the open range of the West. Ranchers in Texas bred the Longhorns with other cattle breeds such as Hereford and Angus to produce quality meat. With beef in demand in the eastern United States. Shrewd businessmen capitalized on the business opportunity, buying cattle for $3 to $5 a head and selling them in eastern and northern markets for as much as $25 to $60 a head. Ranchers hired cowboys to round up, sort out, and drive their herds to railheads in places like Abilene and Dodge City, Kansas, which became famous as cow towns. Raucous boom towns where saloons and brothels proliferated. After the long trail drive, the cattle were loaded onto rail cars and shipped. 
live to local butchers who slaughtered the livestock and prepared the beef. For a 20-year period the plentiful longhorn cattle sustained a booming livestock industry in the West. At least 6 million Texas longhorns were driven across Oklahoma to the cow towns of Kansas. By 1890 the complexion of the industry changed. Farmers and ranchers in the West used a new material, barbed wire, to fence in their lands. Closing the open range, railroads were extended, bringing an end to the long, hard, and much glorified cattle drives, the role of the cowboy changed. Making him little more than a hired hand, and big business took over the industry. Among the entrepreneurs who capitalized on beef's place in the American diet was New England-born Gustavus Swift. 1839-1903, who in 1877 began a large-scale slaughterhouse operation in Chicago. Shipping ready-packed meat via refrigerated rail cars to markets in the east. When was the euro introduced? The euro, the currency of the 12 European Union nations Belgium, Germany, Greece, Spain, France, Ireland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Austria, Portugal, and Finland went into circulation January 1, 2002, becoming part of daily life for more than 300 million people. The banknotes and coins replaced national currencies, making the franc, Deutschmark, Peseta and Lira, among others, history in the participating nations. The euro's origins can be traced to a series of international agreements. Beginning in 1978, which were made among the members of what was then called the European Community, or EC. In February 1986 the framework for the unified monetary system was agreed upon by nations who signed the single European Act, creating an area without internal frontiers in which the free movement of goods, persons, services and capital is ensured. The 1989 Dellers report outlined a plan to introduce the currency in three phases. The final phase of that plan began on January 1, 1999, when the 11 countries later to become 12, belonging to the European Union established the conversion rates between their respective national currencies and the euro, creating a monetary union with a single currency. A three-year transition phase followed, during which monetary transactions could be made in euro, but there was no requirement to do so. On January 1, 2002, the central banks of the 12 participating countries put into circulation about 7.8 billion euro notes and 40.4 billion euro coins, together worth 144 billion euros. Simultaneously each country began to withdraw its own currency from circulation. By February 28, 2002, the changeover was complete. Meaning the national currencies were completely withdrawn and only the euro was in circulation. When 10 new nations, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Malta, Poland, Slovakia, and Slovenia, 
joined the EU on May 1, 2004, there was no timetable for their adoption of the euro. Previously, in 2003, Sweden voted against joining the euro area. How did Carl Sagan popularize science? Carl Sagan, 1934-1996, a Cornell University astronomy and space science professor. Became known to many Americans via his 13-part television program, Cosmos, which first aired on public broadcasting service. PBS, affiliates in the fall of 1980. The show covered a variety of science topics including the origin and evolution of life on Earth, the evolution of the human brain. Black holes, time travel, space exploration, and the ultimate fate of the universe. The program did so well for a while ranking as the highest rated regular series. In public television history that it also spun off a book by the same name. Cosmos, the book, became a bestseller and is still in print. Who were the expansionists? Not long after the colonies won the American Revolution, 1775 to 83, founding the United States of America. A nationalistic, super patriotic spirit emerged in the hearts of many citizens of the new country. Eager to spread American ideals, many looked westward, northward, and southward to expand the territory of the Union beyond the original 13 states. These people were called expansionists. Not only did they favor the settlement of the frontier, but some advocated seizure of the southwest. From Spain and later from Mexico, Florida, from Spain, the Louisiana Territory. From France, and the Northwest Territories and even Canada, from Britain. By the 1840s the doctrine of manifest destiny stating that the United States had a God-given right and duty to expand its territory and influence throughout North America took hold. The fires of expansionism were fanned by population growth during the 1800s. Pioneer settlement of the Plains and the Old Northwest, the present-day states of Ohio. Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota, resulted in an increase in farmland and overall crop production. Yankee ingenuity resulted in inventions such as the cotton gin. 1793, and the McCormick Reaper, 1831, which improved the processing and harvesting of raw materials such as cotton and grain and a continuous influx of immigrants from Europe supplied labor for the factories that had popped up across New England and the Mid-Atlantic states. All these factors combined to create a rapid population growth. In the two decades between 1840 and 1860 alone, the population of the United States more than doubled increasing from just over 17 million to more than 38 million. Though the eastern seaboard cities grew, a system of new canals, steamboats, roads, 
and railroads opened up the interior to increase settlement. By 1850 almost half the population lived outside the original 13 states. Though Canada, of course, remained in the hands of the British, the spirit of expansionism resulted. In the United States relatively speedy acquisition of North American territories that had belonged to Spain. Mexico, France and the British, by 1853 the United States owned all the territory of the present-day contiguous states. And by the end of the century, it owned all the territory of its present-day states including Alaska, purchased from Russia in 1867, and Hawaii, annexed in 1898. What is black gold? Black gold is a term for oil or petroleum black because of its appearance when it comes out of the ground. And gold because it made prospectors, drillers, and oil industry men rich. The oil industry in the United States began in 1859 when retired railroad conductor Edwin L. Drake, 1819-1880, drilled a well near Titusville, Pennsylvania. His drill, powered by an old steam engine, struck oil. Oil from animal tallow and whales, had been used as a lubricant since colonial times. The discovery of a process for deriving kerosene, a clean burning and easy lighting fuel. From coal oil had been patented in 1854. After Drake's Titusville well produced shale oil. The substance was analyzed for its properties and it, too, was determined to be an excellent source of kerosene. Soon others began prospecting for rock oil. Western Pennsylvania became an important oil producing region. Wagons and river barges transported barrels to market, later, the railroad reached into the region. And by 1875 a pipeline was built to carry the oil directly to Pittsburgh. Petroleum products soon replaced whale oil as a fluid for illumination. During the 1880s, Ohio, Kentucky, Illinois, and Indiana also produced oil. In 1901 the famous Spindletop field in eastern Texas produced. The nation's first gusher oil literally sprang out of the earth. During the next decade, California and Oklahoma joined Texas to lead the nation's oil production. Between 1859 and 1900, U.S. oil production boomed, just 2,000 barrels were produced the year it was discovered in Pennsylvania. More than 64 million barrels were produced annually by the turn of the century. The second half of the 1800s saw the oil industry boom, the fuel was used for lighting, heating, and lubrication principally of machinery and tools. But the advent of the automobile and its central role in the life of 20th century America made the oil industry richer yet. Demand soon exceeded the nation's supply of petroleum. Prompting the United States to increasingly rely on imported oil for fuel. What was the Iran-Contra affair? It was a series of actions on the part of you. 
US federal government officials, which came to light in November 1986. The discoveries had the immediate effect of hurting President Ronald Reagan, 1911 to 2004, whose policy of anti-terrorism had been undermined by activities initiated from his own executive office. Following in-depth hearings and investigations into who knew what, when, Special Prosecutor Lawrence Walsh 1912, submitted his report on January 18, 1994, stating that the dealings with Iran and with the Contra rebels in Nicaragua had violated United States policy and law. The tangled string of events involved Reagan's national security advisors Robert McFarlane. 1937, and Admiral John Poindexter, 1936, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, 1943. Poindexter's military aid, the Iranian government, and Nicaraguan rebels. The U.S. officials evidently had begun their dealings with both the Iranian government and the Nicaraguan rebels with the goal of freeing seven Americans who were held hostage by Iranian-backed rebels in Lebanon. President Reagan had met with the families of the captives and was naturally concerned about the hostage situation. Under pressure to work to free the hostages, McFarlane, Poindexter, and North arranged to sell an estimated $30 million in spare parts and anti-aircraft missiles to Iran, then at war with neighboring Iraq. In return, the Iranian government would put pressure on the terrorist groups to release the Americans. Profits from the arms sale to Iran were then diverted by Lt. North to the Contras in Central America who were fighting the dictatorial Nicaraguan government. Congress had already passed laws that prohibited U.S. government aid to the Nicaraguan rebels. The diversion of funds certainly appeared to violate those laws. The Iran-Contra affair led to North's dismissal and to Poindexter's resignation. Both men were prosecuted, though the hostages were freed. Reagan's public image was seriously damaged by how the release had been achieved. During the Iran-Contra hearings in 1987, National Security Commission officials revealed that they had been willing to take the risk of providing arms to Iran in exchange for the safe release of the hostages because they all remembered the U.S. government's failed attempt in 1980 to rescue hostages held at the American embassy in Tehran, Iran. Nevertheless, the deal with Iran had supplied a hostile country with American arms that could then be used against the United States. In 1987 Iran did launch an offensive when it attacked Kuwaiti oil tankers that were registered as American and laid mines in the Persian Gulf. The United States responded by sending in the Navy, which attacked Iranian patrol boats. During this military initiative, the U.S. Navy accidentally shot down a civilian passenger jet, killing everyone on board. 